today on Quest, Olympic figure skater Paulina Edmonds. Life is a quest for logic and reason. It is a quest to find balance between science and faith. Life is a quest for knowledge and understanding. But most importantly, it's a quest for personal discovery. Whatever your quest, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. Welcome to Quest. Hello everyone, I'm your host, Todd Fisher, and this is Quest. For those of you that might be new listeners, let me tell you a little about me. I'm the founder of Metatomics and the author of the best-selling book, Metatomics, The Grand Design. I'm a philosopher, a theorist, a metaphysicist. I'm a perpetual pupil of theology, and I'm an expert in comparative religious study. I've also extensively researched the mind-body connection, anatomy, and physiology. I documented over 300 case studies while researching my book, all from a scientific perspective, with cases that ranged from near-death and out-of-body experiences to possession to past-life experiences, as well as the metaphysical, the paranormal, and other unexplained cases of a spiritual nature. This podcast will bring you some of those astonishing stories, and in some cases by the people that actually lived them. From time to time, I'll be talking about important, perhaps even controversial issues from both spiritual and scientific points of view. The world we live in is ever-changing, and there's often a conflict between spirituality and science, And I wanted to bring you this podcast to balance that equation. It will show you how we know what we know. And there's still so much we don't know. For me, curiosity is part of what makes us human. It's the joy of discovery. It's what drives us. It's our quest. Today's guest is Olympic figure skater Paulina Edmonds. Paulina was the youngest member of the U.S. figure skating team in 2014. We get into a great conversation about what the Olympics were like for her, as well as her years of training to get there. You'll be hard-pressed to find a young person that has the discipline that this young lady has. We also get into her schooling and her thesis project on the science of happiness. Here's today's interview. Hope you enjoy. Welcome to Quest. Today, my guest is Paulina Edmonds. Welcome to the show, Paulina. Hi, thanks for having me. So I'm really excited to have you on the podcast today. You are the first athlete that I've had on the Quest podcast. So I'm very interested in getting into your career, which is exceptional. So I'm going to just run through a little bit about your background for the listeners who might not know who you are. So at age 15, you were the youngest member of the U.S. Olympic skating team in 2014. You were a 2015 Four Continents champion, a two-time U.S. silver medalist, a three-time world team member, um, a two-time junior Grand Prix gold medalist, 2013 U.S. junior national champion. This is a lot of stuff. This is really impressive. Congratulations on all of this. For Thank one. you. <laughs> So this is a really cool, you know, so, you know, not everyone gets to go to the Olympics. Like you are the best of the best when you get to that place. So tell me how you got started skating. How far back does this go for you? What is this like in this training and all of the stuff that has to go into this? Yeah, I first stepped on the ice when I was two years old. Um, my mom is a skating coach, so I was a rink baby. Um, all the time growing up and she put me on really young and I kept skating my entire life essentially. Um, And I was competitive um, all throughout my childhood and my teenage years. And I was kind of trained as an elite athlete starting from like six or seven already. So much um, time commitment, skating before and after school. Um, Everything pretty much went into skating and When I was 14, I won my first national championship as a junior. And then the next year at age 15, I was on the Olympic team. So 
in high school, I was traveling all over the world to compete for Team USA. And um, it was super exciting uh, to represent my country and also kind of have the recognition from people outside of skating, um, aka my school, my hometown, um, anybody that I really knew growing up, um, see that all the hard work I had put in as um, a little kid was paying off uh, as a teenager, basically. And Wow. Yeah. So you grew up in California, is that correct? I did, yes. I grew up yeah. in San Jose, California. So when you were really training to be this this gay skater, did you have a regular school career like most kids? Were you in regular public school or were you homeschooled? How did the how did schooling work with the amount of training you had to put in? Yes, I, I went to normal school, uh, regular elementary, middle, and high school um, growing up. And uh, most people in my position in both skating and other sports are homeschooled pretty much by the time they're in middle school, definitely in high school. Um, but my parents really wanted me to have the equal opportunity um, academically and to rely on my education when kind of you never know what's going to happen in sport. I, you never knew what was going to happen with my skating career. Um, it's, it's so unpredictable. Um, and it's kind of just a really big dream that most people never really get to accomplish. And so I had my academics right up there with me just as important, um, which I'm super thankful for now because I think socially it was extremely important for me to develop social skills with people my own age growing up and kind of be introduced to different ideas and different ways of thinking. Um, and so I'm super comfortable in social situations and making friends and kind of shifting my viewpoints um, as opposed to a lot of kids who are way more sheltered being homeschooled and just, you know, everything they know in their life is sport. Sure, sure. That's, uh, that's really interesting. So how many hours, like, tell me what your practice regime was like back then. Uh, you know, was it something where, you know, it was an hour after school that you practice or were you, were you had eight, did you have eight hour commitments and your weekends were booked? Like, what was that like to be able to be, have the endurance and be as fit as you needed to be at such a young age for the Olympics? What was that? Take me, walk me through that. Yes. I, when I was in elementary school, I was getting up at 5 a.m. three days a week and skating an hour before school and then changing and eating in the car on my way um, to school and I would sit in class for six hours and then jump right back in the car, change, eat and get to the ice rink and skate for another few hours um, and then come back home finally at the end of the day to eat dinner, do homework and then go to sleep early to get a full night's rest before I did the same thing essentially. Oh my. Um, yeah, so I had a very, very packed schedule growing up, um, and it got a little bit easier for me in high school because I had a block schedule, so I could come a little bit later in the morning, so I got up at six instead of five, which honestly makes a huge difference, so <laughs> um, yeah, but I um, was competing internationally when I was in high school, so I would miss weeks at a time. Um, to go to China or to go to France or Russia or wherever I was being sent to. Um, and my school was super helpful with that. Uh, my teachers were sending me with schoolwork to do um, when I traveled and when I came back, I can make up tests and anything I'd missed. Um, so it was really great having that support, uh, but definitely super challenging um, because at the end of the year, I would have missed around 10 to 11 weeks of school. So my final tests right before summer started were usually pretty difficult for me just because, um, yeah, missing the information was not fun yeah. <laughs> for testing. Yeah. Well, I can't imagine in elementary school having a schedule like that, like the amount of discipline it has to take to, to do that. Like I can't imagine getting up at five in the morning when I was, would be in elementary school. Like that's just insane to even comprehend that. And uh, it's just, that's incredible. Like it, that it really does separate the, the hobby enthusiast from the person that wants to be the professional in terms of this that type of dedication. How many, tell me about the kind of how it is with the Olympic skating team. So you, you have to, so, uh, cause I'm not really too familiar with how this works. So you have to compete in different types of like tournaments or, or uh, like 
things around the world to qualify to be eligible to be an, an Olympic skater? How does it work to work up into that? How do you get accepted onto the Olympic team? So um, when you're around like 13, 14, 15, uh, early teens, essentially, you're usually a junior. Um, at least that was the case when I was competing. Um, now mm -hmm. the girls are so much younger, but um, you get kind of sent out to random countries um, to compete as a junior and junior Grand Prix. And those are kind of the baby international competitions where you kind of get a feel and get introduced to the international community. And then once you're a senior, um, they'll send you out to senior Grand Prix, which are very competitive. They're um, only 12 skaters um, at each competition, each Grand Prix really, um, and they're all from kind of different countries. And so to be sent out for a Grand Prix is a pretty big deal. And if you compete well and show that you have good results internationally, then you'll be seriously con considered to be put on a world team or Olympic team um, because they decide uh, who makes the team basically at our nationals. And so those are kind of our trials. Um, and they'll say that it's not a trials and that they go based off that competition and then your previous history. So you kind of need to have like good backing and show that you are consistent at each competition. But sure. ultimately, um, they will kind of go off the podium scoring at our nationals based off of like, yeah, who makes the team at that point. And so if you are competing well all season and then you compete super well at nationals, you're going to be pretty guaranteed the slot. Um, so I got really lucky because I was competing as a junior during the fall um, and I was winning my junior events and um, I made it to the top six basically of the world in juniors and I competed at this huge competition with seniors as well um, a month before our nationals. And so when I had gone to nationals, I was kind of riding off of that um, rhythm and I competed super well and um, got second. And so we had three spots and they placed me on the team. So I was, I was really lucky to be considered because as a junior, they could have just kind of passed me over to the junior role team and told me to wait another four years. But right. Right. Yeah. yeah I was so, very, very strong talking to the media <laughs> and saying <laughs> that I wanted to go to the Olympics and not junior world. So they put me on. And, and, and do, does the, like the U S Olympic skating committee they do they send scouts to these events and they watch you or is it just a matter of like they're getting the reports sent back to them somewhere in an office in Colorado of how you're doing do they actually are they there watching you are there people actually kind of scouting you in a way there there are sometimes um there's people that work with the Olympic Training Center and um yeah the Olympic Committee that'll come out to the competitions or camps and keep an eye on what's going on but ultimately U.S. figure skating um has the main control in picking everyone. And so they are constantly watching uh, like every competition and monitoring who they think is going to score the best. And with that, they kind of throw their chips into who they think uh, is going to do well. So it's really a co combination of uh, federation politics and then skaters performing consistently and well. <laughs> right. So how many people make the skating team? Usually we have two or three slots um, and it's kind of dependent on how we do at the world championships the year before. And so if we have two skaters um, ending with their placement number adding up to 13. So say we have like a girl that plays fifth and a girl that plays seventh uh, adding up that places that's like 12. So we would get three spots for the next year. So basically you want to compete well at Worlds so that you, again, get three spots the next year. I see. I see. Yeah. So tell me what it was like. So in, in 2014, where, where were the, remind me where the Winter Olympics were at that year? They were in Sochi, Russia. Okay. So what was that like, that experience as a 15-year-old girl to participate on this world stage, televised in a, in a foreign country, with all of this pomp and circumstance, what was that like? It was absolutely incredible. Um, I was really thrust into the media spotlight at that point, and I was relishing it because, 
you know, my 5 a.m. skating uh, routines growing up in elementary school were all worth it at that point. And all of my friends who knew that I was doing skating but didn't quite understand the full scope of what was going on, um, everyone in my hometown was so excited for me. And, you know, the Olympics are a really big deal. So getting that recognition from random people who were not associated with skating was probably the best part for me. And so when I was at the Olympics and there were cameras everywhere following your every move, um, I really enjoyed it because I just kept thinking that everybody at home was watching me and that I was on TV. And um, it was it was a really cool feeling to know that I had reached that like highest point um, that every skater really dreams of. So, Right. And were you in both the opening and the closing ceremonies? Did you participate in all that? I was in the closing ceremony. I unfortunately <laughs> didn't attend the opening ceremony uh, because normally for a lot of like skaters and um, other uh, sports, they don't always attend the opening because it's a lot of walking and it kind of, you know, makes your legs tired. It gives you a lot of adrenaline and excitement. And that's not always good, like right before competition, because you want to be as calm and focused as possible. Um, So a lot of people actually skip it. Um, And so I skipped it um, because we also were at the end of the week um, or the Olympics are two weeks long and skating is at the end of two weeks. And so I actually wasn't in Sochi until the second week because there's no ice time for us to practice um, because the speed skaters were using it. So what all the athletes did was actually fly out to neighboring countries and we would train for a week in a random ice rink. Um, So the U.S. girls were in Austria for a full week before flying into Sochi right before we competed. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I had never really thought about that, about all the walking and participating in something like that. That's really, really interesting. Yeah. So, you, so you, was there a lot of, was there a lot of camaraderie among gen, gen, like generally different people competing in different sports? Is, is it, is the, are the U.S. Olympics and all of those athletes, is it, is it a tight knit family or are you pretty compartmentalized? Like you're with other skaters and you don't really socialize with the bobsled team, you know, is, or does everyone kind of know everyone? Everyone is definitely friends with each other. Um, it was really amazing for me to experience because, uh, as a, just a newbie, even in the skating team, um, me being 15, so young, I was like almost 10 years younger than some of the, um, teammates that I had. And they welcomed me with open arms, um, which they really didn't need to do. They could have snubbed me. You know, I was um, not part of their senior squad, so to speak. Um, but they were just like all like older siblings to me and taking me under their wing. And so when I would go to uh, the cafeteria and um, the, you know, different areas that they had in place, um, pathways, whatever, uh, in the Olympic Village, and I was, you know, seeing different countries, different um, groups of sports from Team USA. Everybody was so nice. Everybody had like such respect um, for one another, no matter where you were from, what age you were, it didn't matter. Um, And so I was actually sitting a lot of the time with hockey players, and I met some speed skaters, and I I met a lot of different sportsmen. And um, yeah, everybody was super welcoming, super friendly, and everyone was just so grateful to be a part of the 2014 um, experience. <clears throat> That's great. That's great. Um, wow. I can't imagine. So I, what I'm curious about, so uh, you had competed so much before you got to this place. So I imagine on a lot of levels, you must, you must have gotten nerves when you competed in a lot of these previous <clears throat> um, competitions. But on that stage, were the nerves the same as other events that you had done or are they bigger? Is every, because everything is bigger on something like this enormous televised Olympic event, were the nerves also bigger or had you trained yourself to not have nerves a long time ago? There's definitely nerves every single competition. Um, but it's interesting because I would always mentally tell myself at any competition, um, if I was kind of getting too riled up or too nervous, I would just mentally say, it's not the Olympics, you know, it's, this isn't the Olympics. There's no reason to get like so worked up or, um, you know, this is just training for the Olympics. Like even if I was at a world championships, which which was the biggest competition of the year, I would just mentally say, you know, that's not the Olympics. 
So right. when I was at the Olympics, there's kind of nowhere else to go from there. And it was, <laughs> yeah, like it is the Olympics. Um, so I, I was, since I was young and I was kind of competing like constantly, um, I was used to the nerves and used to um, just kind of putting on the horse blinders and letting my body um, do its muscle memory. Um, but I definitely had a moment where I was, you know, my name was called and I was skating to my position and I realized that everybody at home was watching me. Everybody in the world was watching me. Um, and it was just the biggest platform to be exposed on. And um, it made me scared in a way, but at the same time, it just made me so excited to be able to show what I could do and show um, everything that I had put my life into and show that I was good enough to be there. And so I think that was kind of the switch in my brain that took a more positive outlook rather than a negative one. Um, and that really helps me elevate myself to perform well. Wow. Amazing. And you know, of, of the Olympic winter Olympic events, women's figure skating is one of the most watched events. Like that's the prime time thing in America. You know, everyone loves that. It's figure skating is like so awesomely popular in America oh, yeah. that definitely you were being watched by America at that <laughs> moment. You probably had the highest rated hour on television at that time. <clears throat> so it's pretty interesting to think of how many millions of people probably did tune in just in America, not counting the rest of the world. Yeah, totally. Incredible. Incredible. <laughs> so, you know, with a lot of uh, Olympic events, a lot of events are tied to, speed or distance or a height something that there's really no uh there's really no dispute in the accuracy of it you know but in figure skating this is something that you're being judged at there's always it's always interesting to hear people and and their opinions on the aspect of having you know three judges judging performances versus the accuracy of being able to you know you pull vault higher than someone else or or jump further or go faster than someone else now, what are your feelings on judging is judging fair could computers be doing all this and really just gauging the technical aspect of this do you do you know where i'm coming from with this like is is, is can judging be be incorrect in some places or you know you want to believe that a judge is going to have a balanced opinion across the board with all athletes, but are there, could there be errors in that? Totally. Um, it's, a, it's a very subjective sport. Uh, people have different opinions and different preferences in what kind of style they want to be watching, um, which is kind of where you run into trouble because, um, you know, people might have a certain way that they like to see skating. And so when things change or when you have a skater come out and do something different, um, it's not always received well, even though it could be just as creative, just as beautiful, it's just different. Um, but I do think it's necessary for there to be um, people judging it uh, rather than computers, because while it is a sport first, I believe, um, technically like that should be more important, whether or not you can hit all the jumps, the spins, everything. Um, the second part of it, the components, the, the dance, the grace that you see with skating is really why um, the general public watches it because they don't know what they're looking at, whether um, it, a jump or a spin, they're impressed no matter what you do, but um, people can really connect to a skater that is graceful, a skater that's beautiful, a skater that is, um, creatively like an artist on the ice and so it is kind of necessary for a human eye to watch it and really to be in the arena because it's different than sitting and watching it on a screen um in person sure you can really feel uh i guess the emotion in the movement and you can feel the energy in the crowd too um and it makes just such a difference um when they can connect with the person that's sitting, you know, on the highest row of the arena and the whole crowd stands up and gives them a standing ovation. Um, you just don't get that same feeling on TV. And so it's, it's really important that we have people watching, but I think the issues that we really run into now with judging are a lot of judges, they're volunteers. They're not. Um, and a lot of them either never skated themselves or they skated as an adult skaters. 
uh, which is fine, but they don't understand the same, um, I guess, technique and difficulty and everything that um, we as elite skaters go through. And so it's, it's really easy and flippant for them to make comments and preferences about how people should maybe do jumps or spins or whatever, whether or not there should be more choreography or less um, when they haven't actually done it themselves. And so it just makes things hard um, to kind of get feedback and to have them understand, you know, that there need to be certain ways that we do things um, and it can't just all be, you know, whatever they ideas that they have in their head. Um, but right. it's also, it's difficult because there's a lot of skaters now um, who may have sponsors or have um, pull from their federation because they're kind of being put out as the favorite. Um, so when they make mistakes, judges still judge them high, but there may be skaters who perform better that day um, technically and um, are stronger because they didn't make any mistakes, but they're still scored lower because of that politics um, and because the judges kind of have a set um, list in their head already before they sit down and actually watch the event. Um, and it's unfortunate, sure. but it, it's very true. And so with that in mind, um, I don't think that judges should be kind of comparing skating style until every skater can perform clean, as in they hit every single element perfectly. Um, but we'll see skaters who maybe have um, like a lighter appearance, maybe they're more balletic, but they, um, and they don't make any mistakes, but maybe uh, a judge likes the shorter, um, more powerful skater, uh, the more athletic one. Um, but you can't really judge the style until they're both competing the same technically. And so that's kind of the problem we run into today because technically skaters are doing different things, but judges are still kind of judging based off of um, the style. Are there, are there figure skating moves that are illegal to do? There are. Um, I'm pretty sure doing a backflip is illegal. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it seems difficult. Most people, uh, all of my friends always ask me if I can do a backflip and they think that it would be the most amazing thing to do in a competition. But realistically, it's not as different or not as um, technically difficult or challenging to do that um, as it is to spin in the air. It takes like 10 years to be able to pretty much do a triple. Um, and that's like years and years of training your legs, how to move the small muscles to be able to spin really fast um, versus just doing a backflip. Once you have the power, it really doesn't take that much, um, I guess, technical ability to flip yourself over in the air. So that's why it's not you, that cool. You mentioned a moment ago about um, maybe someone's performance being more balletic. Mm -hmm. uh, so is there a magic combination of how much is just <clears throat> your your ability to skate well on ice and to know the ice versus your physical fitness aspect versus your dance. Is there a, is it 33% across the board for each? Is it a little bit more dance? Is it a little bit more having to be in perfect physical shape? Is it a little bit more about just knowing the surface you're on and really being able to have the balance on the ice? What, what is the combination? I think the most important thing, um, I think you need to like landing your elements are probably like the number one. Um, if you're a beautiful skater, but you make mistakes, you're never going to be on top. Um, you need to have the combination. Um, but I also think it's really the best thing that people kind of look for is if their skating like draws your eye and makes you feel something um, like they're a really beautiful skater, but combining the strength um, of speed of hitting the elements and making it look effortless um, just all of those factors combined is what I guess the ideal skater is um, for judges. And I don't think it really has to do with um, like body type or shape or fit level. Um, you know, pretty much every skater in the elite level is super fit. Um, but of course we all come in different shapes and sizes. And right. I think that people kind of lose um, a sense of reality of, you know, every person has their own kind of, fit um look i guess um but if they can do everything and, and they 
can shine um, in their particular style, it's amazing. Uh, but people kind of get the misconception of you have to be maybe like, right now it's really popular for there to be young girls. Um, we have a lot of Russian and Korean skaters right now on top who are tiny little 15 year olds who look like they're 12 and they have like twig legs. Um, wow. Which is, I mean, like they're just, really, they're really thin because they're really young um, and they can do all the elements, but that's not realistic for somebody, you know, my age or somebody 18 or right. 20 or if there's a skater's 25, they're going to be more of a womanly figure. They're going to, some are naturally tall and willow, some are shorter and really muscular. Um, but I don't think that that matters. Um, you know, everybody can be different, but still super strong in their own way. Um, and I think a lot of people are leaning towards being that tiny petite, um, 15 year old looking skater, but that's not necessary if you can hit all the jumps and, you know, shine in your particular style. Amazing. That's, that's a great way to put it really. And you, and you actually have a significant dance background, right? I do. Yes. I took, um, ballet as well as jazz and tap, uh, my childhood growing up. So I have a lot of dance background. <laughs> And, and the ballet probably came in most useful for figure skating, I would imagine. Is that correct? Definitely. Um, ballet has just really um, developed in me a grace and, and um, a lyrical ability to like feel the music and feel, I guess, look pretty on the ice. Um, but uh, I really love taking my jazz classes as well. Um, and I took some ballroom classes when I did ballroom style dance. So I took cha-cha, salsa, and flamenco um, when I made programs that were like that. Um, and so I think it's really important to develop uh, proper dance technique um, because a lot of skaters don't really take dance classes and then all of their choreography kind of looks the same. Um, mm. You know, just using like sharp arm movements to go with the music. But when you really take a class, um, your whole body moves in a different way. And I think that really makes a difference um, in a program. When you, you, so you're a kind of Olympic village experience. It's, a, it's interesting to me because people from all of countries all over the world are converging in one place at one time. So you get a lot of different cultures coming together. And with those cultures, a lot of different types of religions and spiritualities. Did you notice people engaging in religion while at the, these games, was, was religion and spirituality important? It's not anything you ever actually see on television during the Olympic coverage. I imagine people must have their own practices. There's not a, a, a temple at the, the Olympic Village, is there? How do people, you, people must be practicing this, right? Yeah, I definitely think there's a lot of athletes that have, um, spirituality or kind of religion or connection to God in some way. And a lot of them, um, you know, put their faith in their training and in God and trust and, you know, all of that. And um, I know a lot of skaters um, and athletes will pray, you know, before they um, compete, step on the yeah. ice yeah. or when they're on the ice before their name is called, they'll do a quick prayer. Um, and it's, it's definitely a sense of comfort. Um, and, you know, I found myself doing the same thing. I would always say a quick prayer to God after my <laughs> name was called yeah. um, and kind of put my trust in both my training and him. And so it's, it's really helpful to kind of feel like there's this, I don't know, higher sense that everything's going to be all right, like no matter what. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, so you wound up having a foot injury. Is that right? Is that, was it, you took an injury that kind of kept you out of the last Olympic uh, Winter Olympics. Did you have a foot injury? Is that what it was? I did. I um, I had a navicular bone bruise in my foot, which is this tiny little bone that doesn't have a lot of blood supply. So it takes a really long time to heal. And it was in my tapping and my landing foot. So I was having just excruciating pain every time I tried to do a jump, um, which led me to take a lot of time off um, from skating, which was pretty devastating from a sports career standpoint because I was off the ice for almost two years um, but uh, really really good timing for me to be attending college uh, right when that happened because I was able to switch my focus into academics and open my eyes to a completely different world and experience a lot of things I never would have been able to if I were in skating training at the time. Now, for not, I'm not a foot expert by any means. So the little bone that you, was affected you, where was that at in your foot? Was it actually like in a toe or was it 
in the foot itself? Where was that at that would that this little bone could cause such a big problem? So it was on the inside of my right foot, um, pretty much in the middle of my arch. And so every time I would like tap my toe into the ice, um, like it would shock into my arch and just be mm. like super painful. Um, so yeah, so I kind of needed to take a lot of time off um, and kind of get different arch supports, even for my foot. Um, I was in a boot even for a few months um, to stay off of it and like not put my weight on it. Um, yeah, it was, it was a really challenging time um, for an athlete to not be able to use her foot. <laughs> yeah, and with, a, with a, a bone bruise like that, it's really something you just have to wait it out and let it heal versus like other like a lot of ballerinas will have uh, issues with their toes naturally and they'll wind up getting bones fused together in those places and they continue but this wasn't something you could do that with right you just have to kind of let it heal it's kind of like a uh, you know like a like a, a a stress fracture in a bone almost you kind of it would almost be faster if it was broken and rehealed versus waiting for it to heal up. Does that make sense? Yeah, it was, it was really <laughs> kind of horrible because um, it was on its way to a stress fracture um, and on its way to being broken. And if I was told by all these doctors at the Olympic um, training center that if I broke it, it would be career ending surgery. Um, so yeah. definitely didn't want that to happen. So I really needed to take the time to heal it. But at the same time, um, even when I did think it was healed and the MRIs came back, um, like looking solid, I was also told by doctors that it was kind of like, like an eggshell, like it appeared fine, but it could have, it still was super sensitive, like really thin. Um, and it was super easy to crack again, which happened to me. Um, I took a few months off, thought it was healed, went back in a really crazy training for six months. And by the end of the six months, it returned. Um, and then I had to take even more time off. And so because it's a bone, there's really nothing I can do except rest. Wow. And um, if it were like a muscle or, you know, a tendon or anything, um, you know, we could stick a cortisone shot in it and I could go compete and then like take time off when the season, you know, wasn't happening. But unfortunately with my bone bruise, I had no options. Um, and so there was no yeah. choice but to wait it out. Is it fully healed now? It is. It's fully yeah. healed, probably stronger than ever. <laughs> good, good. But so when you had the injury, that gave you the perfect opportunity to go to college. So you went to Santa Clara University, is that correct? I did. I um, attended Santa Clara University pretty much right after I got injured. Um, and I basically got to have the full college experience and the full college life. Um, so that was really a blessing in disguise for me, I think. <laughs> Did people know you in university? Were you a celebrity when you showed up on campus? <laughs> yeah, honestly, I was pretty well known um, for all four years. Uh, there were a lot of people who um, maybe didn't directly know me, but knew that there was an Olympic figure skater. Um, and so it, it was really interesting kind of having that, I guess, low key fame, um, but it was fun too. <laughs> yeah. And you got you have a degree now, so you're you just graduated, right? Yeah, I just graduated from Santa Clara. I have a Bachelor of Arts degree in communication, and I also minored in business. So, yeah, feels well, very great. cool. You just keep moving. You just keep moving forward. There's no stopping you with anything. Look at this. It'll be crazy to see what you're going to do over the next ten years. I'm really excited about that. What, so you did a, so one of the things I was really interested in wanting to talk about was you did a, a thesis called the science of happiness. Let's talk about this. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I took a few classes. It was really competitive, um, in my school to get placed. Everybody wants to take it. Um, there's only one teacher who teaches it once a year. Um, so I was placed in this science of happiness class. Um, I think when I was a sophomore and as my senior year approached, um, we're kind of put into these senior thesis classes where um, we kind of have like one focus and develop a project, whatever on it. Um, and so uh, since I had taken that science of happiness class before I qualified for the thesis class. So I was put into it and I was super excited because um, it was something I was super fascinated, super interested in, really passionate about um, in learning. And so I kind of 
did a lot of research, read a lot of different books on the different ideas and I guess psychology um, of the brain and how our brains work um, to look for positive experiences that in turn make us happy um, and why our brain is really wired um, to look for negative experiences and how we can change that. Um, and so I kind of wrote a book on how the little things in life are actually the big things um, and they're way bigger on a grand scale than any big thing that we could um, imagine happening to us. Wow. Wow. And so, it ta- yeah. let's, so let's talk about that. What types of little things are you talking about? Are they little moments and little gestures or little kindnesses or are they experiences? Are they places you go to? Give me an example. Yeah. So um, um, basically I, I really uh, because there's, we kind of have a set structure of how our days go, you know, who we're going to see, what we're going to do. Um, there's a lot of small surprises, unexpected curveballs, um, anything that we kind of experience emotions um, that can be spiked, like due to anticipated and unanticipated events. Um, those are going to have a way bigger effect on our happiness because they're daily things that we're constantly experiencing um, versus, you know, big things are really few and far between. And even though, they can bring us a lot of happiness or a lot of sadness, um, whatever the event may be. Um, we're gonna gradually come back to the same level that we like experience on a daily basis um, at some point. And so that's why looking at little things and how they affect um, our mood and how they affect how we talk to people and how we think about ourselves, um, those are really important to developing happiness and developing um, a positive outlook on life that leads you or leaves you feeling good, you know, every day and not feeling like negative. I like hearing this because I've talked about this before on my podcast. And uh, I was a, I was a guest on um, Dr. Drew Pinsky's podcast last fall. And he mentioned this term to me. I had never heard it before. And he said that there's a new term evolving in kind of the psychiatric world that is called, basically it's ordinary misery. And that today people are living in ordinary misery with just periods of happiness. And that everything else was really ordinary misery. And I was like so fascinated by that term. And I've talked about it with people uh, on, on different uh, episodes that I've done here. And it does appear that that's the world we live in today. Um, and, and this, we talked, and Drew and I talked about this before COVID ever hit and before there were, you know, uh, protests and riots and all of these things which have just drained the public more. So to hear you, and every time I talk to you, you're always so energetic and you're always so positive. I love it. And here Mm -hmm. you are talking about the science of happiness and how this can work. And I think it's just kind of a, it's a, it's a great different way of slant. And I think people have to hear things like this so that they don't give in to the idea that their life is really ordinary misery. Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really dependent on, you know, the actions that you take yourself and the way like your intentional, um, activities, your thoughts and actions, like those are what are going to transform the way that you live your life. And I think a lot of people, um, in today's world don't realize that, don't know that. And they think, you know, all the different factors going on in their life are making them, whether it's depressed or just unhappy or miserable or anything, um, they can actively make a change to create a positive life for themselves. And people just aren't doing it. Um, And people just, I don't think are realizing. And that's kind of something that I um, came to know when I took the class because so many of the things that I learned are very common sense things, very obvious things um, in my opinion. And nothing is really newfound. but I did realize that I hadn't even been thinking about that myself before. And now that I know this, it's, it seems so simple. And why doesn't everyone do it? And so I think just a lot of people aren't aware um, and they need to be. It's, it's interesting to me because you've attained one of the highest goals one could attain in an athletic field, really. And, you know, what you do at the Olympics, whether you – are the gold medalist at the Olympics or not is inconsequential. The fact that you made it there 
is the is the big thing. It's like being in the World Series for baseball. You may not win the World Series, but you got there. You know, like it doesn't get any higher than that, really, until you medal or have a ring or whatever it is that that it is. That's the the ultimate top of the of the heap. But you know, having that at fifteen, and now we're putting. Is your twenty one now? Is that right or twenty two? I'm 22. You're 22. <laughs> so we're putting a little distance, you know, eight years or so away from when that happened. The bar is set so high at that point. How do you not be a, how do you not be a little depressed or down after seeing that in the rearview mirror in a way? Like, what do you have to do to keep yourself positive and moving forward, knowing that you've already achieved such big goals for such a young person? What do you, what do you, do you have to set a goal to, to, to do the next big thing? Like, what is it that Paulina has to do to keep, to keep an even keel in a way? You know, this is kind of where my education uh, comes into play when that question's asked, um, mostly because it's true. You know, I know a lot of athletes, a lot of skaters who end their career and are just left you know, in a depression because they don't know where to go from there and they don't have the tools to kind of change paths and um, look towards a new career. Um, and they kind of have to start from zero. But because I've always gone to school and now like, you know, I'm, I'm college graduated, I've already done that, which is amazing. Um, I have all the tools and like all the passion and interest to go in these different ways and I feel like there's so many doors open and so many different paths that I could take. Um, and that's really because of the education that happened. Is I've always been excited um, to kind of go in different directions and have a career other than sport. Um, and I always knew that that was kind of going to be a thing for me. Um, yeah. And it, it's definitely been crazy for me because when I was in college and I was living with other kids um, my age, I had like, you know, as a sophomore, I had four different roommates and they would even, you know, tell me that they were working, they were just starting out their careers, their dreams. They were just starting like the start point for reaching the top, which is just a dream that they would have um, in their careers someday, many years in the future. And they would look at me and they'd say, it's insane that you've already reached the top in something and like now you're doing something else like that is crazy and I just can't even like look at myself like that way because to me it was just kind of this passion that I had and it was kind of my job I guess as a child but now I'm moving on in a different direction but um yeah it's yeah. really cool <laughs> and, and I think you're absolutely right when it comes to people who who have ended their skating careers and then not known what to do because there's probably a lot of elements at play there one that they're homeschooled or maybe their, their lack of social skills and then only knowing this one thing for 20 years of their life and then having to compartmentalize it and then literally start from scratch in a whole lot of ways. And I think because you did get your regular schooling experience all the way through college has kept you more centered and adjusted and prepared for what's next. And certainly you've proven to the world that you have the discipline to get to the highest level, which is why it's going to be so exciting to see your next 10 years. Because if you apply the same thing you applied, you know, to the first 20 years, there's no doubt you're going to do something incredible for the next, right? Totally. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Well, Paulina, it's been really a pleasure for me to have you as a guest today. You really, you told a lot of great stories and, and gave the listeners a lot of, uh, nice little behind the scenes chunk of what your world is like. And, uh, and I really uh, can't thank you enough for that. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. So for having me. how can people find you out there? You're, you have, so you have a, a fitness uh, thing that you do and you have a website for that. And you also are out on social media. How can people find you? Yeah. Um, so I have my social media accounts. Um, you can find me on Instagram. It's just my name at Polina Edmonds. And um, I also have a website uh, that I just created during quarantine and it kind of gives my fitness workouts that you can sign up for. Um, and I have a lot of kind of healthy recipes that I've learned along the way in my career and just being in college. So that's called pa Paul Powered and uh, it's just www.paulpowered.com. So you can just look that up on Google and 
should pop up. <laughs> Great. And what's coming up for you? What's next? What will we see next? I, I heard a rumor you might have a podcast coming out yourself. Is that, is that true? I do. Um, I do have a podcast coming out. Uh, it should be released within the next week or so on um, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, basically all the platforms. And I'll be um, kind of broadcasting that on both my website and uh, my Instagram. So you can look out for that. But that is going to be mainly a figure skating based podcast where I talk about the experiences of attending um, school at the same time as sport, um, growing up in that kind of environment. Um, and I'm going to be talking about, you know, skating politics, things that people don't know, things that people don't really ever think about when it comes to sports, but it's really prevalent. And then also keeping a healthy mental and physical state, um, both during career and after career. Um, it's a pretty big adjustment for athletes. So just going to be sharing my experiences and tips on that. Oh, perfect. Perfect. I'm sure that people are going to love that. And I'll tune in myself because I'm, I'm fascinated by this world too. Paulina, thanks for coming out today. And hopefully we get to visit again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. There you have it, Paulina Edmonds. What a great interview. What a remarkable young lady. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you next week on Quest. Thank you for listening to Quest. Please be sure and rate and review this podcast. This podcast is copyright. Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Be sure to visit the official website for the International Association of Metatomics at metatomics.org or find us on social media for other unique content. And make sure to pick up a copy of the book that started a spiritual revolution, Metatomics, The Grand Design, available for sale online and at most major bookstores. Thanks for listening. 